I'm the director of field operations for the Stat Medevac program. Uh, today, uh, on September 11th, uh, on that day, I was a flight paramedic and the compliance specialist for the program. Today, I'm the clinical manager for Stat Medevac. Ten years ago, I was a flight paramedic assigned to Medevac 7. Tom Rolison, and um, I am the regional field support manager. Mike Steele, and I'm a pilot out of Stat Medevac 11 out of Altoona. Tony Zeroya, I'm a transport coordinator, and on September 11th, I was uh, working Medic Command. Well, that morning was a little odd. We noticed our Bayside mechanic was coming up the street in his car, um, and but at a really higher than normal rate of speed and took the turn into the parking lot to our base just as though something was really wrong. Uh, it was a normal morning. It was beautiful, I remember. It was a nice sunny day outside. We were sitting here, we just got done briefing for the day and uh, a report came across the TV that uh, an airplane had crashed. We had a TV in one of the crew rooms, everybody was gathered around and, uh, and I mean it was chaos, total chaos. It's how you know, how's that kind of happen on a clear blue September morning as a plane kind of steer off course? Uh, we, none of us kind of really thought that it would even be terrorism. We were uh, out uh, going through an aircraft and somebody uh, came out and said, uh, did you see the TV? There's a small airplane that flew into the World Trade Center. I mean, people didn't know what was going on and who was next and if you were safe. So we stopped what we were doing and walked into, we had a helicopter base here at the time and uh, looked at the TV and saw the image of a burning World Trade Center. One tower was on fire. And then just to look in his face and said, John, what's going on? He says, dude, we're under attack. At that point, uh, we knew that uh, something had just changed and it was uh, it was pretty bad. If a room could get any quieter than silent. It, it was anger, you know, at first. You know, I think every American thought that. You were really angry and um, uh, you wanted something done, you wanted to do something, even though you didn't know who or what. You know, I made a few phone calls, um, told my uh, told my wife, you know, you need, because we don't know what's going on, you need to plan on going to get some groceries. I think everybody developed a, a kind of a sense of purpose and uh, there wasn't any panic. We all took maybe personal phone calls. I know I took a phone call from my wife, uh, worried about our kids that were young at school at the time. Um, and so uh, we had to deal with some of our personal issues as well as being ready to, to, to respond to the emergency. And it wasn't too long after that that um, we had actually gotten called that we had a, a patient request. Shortly after, um, about the time I think the, one of the towers fell, uh, we had been received word that there was an airplane that they couldn't communicate that was actually flying over Pittsburgh. We didn't really fully understand at that point that the plane that, that ended up crashing in Shanksville literally flew within miles of our base. Sir, they said it was a, uh, on a 747, a uh, big airplane had, had crashed in Fayette County. That was the initial input that came in. In the meantime, um, our chief pilot had been talking with um, uh, Cleveland Center Air Traffic Control to get uh, permission for us to actually respond by air. We grabbed the crew and we headed for, and we found out that it was in Somerset County, and uh, we headed out there and they, we actually responded with almost nine aircraft heading for that accident scene at that time. Our pilot pulled us off to the side and said, you know, we're, we're going to take this mission, but you know, if you see anything, and I do mean if you see anything, if you hear anything, if something doesn't look right, smell right, seem right, you let me know about it right now because we really didn't at that point have any idea how many more were out there, what, what else was going on. And you start hearing other erroneous reports about car bombs at different places and then news started flooding in of different things and at that point it was really uh, we didn't know what was going on. You had to really watch. They were trying to land all the aircraft and get all the aircraft on the ground and you didn't know what was going on. Things were, planes were circling and you were thinking, okay, are they going to crash this thing into the hangar? The changing point of the room um, was we received a call from Somerset 911 about a commercial airliner going down and uh, then pretty much we were involved with what was going on on a national level. And uh, we, were the one, we were the first ones there aviation wise. When you were in defensive mode, you were definitely good towards the skies, making sure uh, Nothing was coming your way. And uh, when we got there, all you could see was a little V cut in the ground. There was really no debris, uh, a little bit of smoke, and then uh, all the ambulance and fire trucks and everything was there. And Everybody with military or police were the only ones allowed to fly. Uh, so at the time, we were kind of in a scramble to aircraft were landing at different locations. I remember seeing a lot of was the uh, evacuation cards that they put in the back of the seats 
and uh, that was they were scattered out through the cornfield. After we found out that there were no survivors and everybody was aborted, um, it was then that the FAA had shut down the airspace for everybody. A little nerve-wracking at first because you know we knew the airspace was shut down. There was absolutely no aircraft flying, other than military at the time. In the 16 years that I've been here, it still stands out in my mind as the is the eeriest flight I've ever been on. And as we're coming in, I mean, pit approach was usually always booming with activity and to be absolutely dead silent and you're the only one talking on the radio. We were it. I mean it was we were the only the only um, you know the air, only civilian aircraft in the air at that time. There was an emergency and we wanted to make a difference. I think everybody that was here that day wanted to make a difference. Uh, we wanted to be able to uh, step in and stop whatever pain and suffering people were actually experiencing. And the frustrating thing was that unfortunately that day we weren't able to do that. I think it, it changed me and everybody else in the country. You know, the world has changed drastically today from what it was then. You're, you're changed forever. I mean, you really are never quite the same again. We have a generation of kids that are, you know, are 10 years old that don't have any memory of that, or 12 years old that have no memory of that day. Myself, I, I think they should, uh, they should play that scene every day of what happened to the towers. What has changed today is that every time I put a flight suit on and I still fly as a flight paramedic, I understand that on that shift, I may be called upon to respond to the exact same incident or something worse that some terrorist has dreamed up. Definitely say what I took for granted, I don't anymore. You know, you gotta be ready to expect the unexpected and the, anything could change at any moment. You know, and we have no, no, we're not in charge of it in any way. Ten years ago, it wasn't, you really couldn't get your head wrapped around somebody intentionally flying jumbo jets into the World Trade Center and uh, bringing them down. Americans, we can, uh, we're strong, we move forward. As long as we remain vigilant and as a country as a whole, um, do what we can to prevent anything like that from ever happening again. We owe it to those, um, emergency services providers who went to work that morning and, and never went home um, to, to never forget them.